So thank you everyone uh, to attend uh, my talk. Uh, this, this is the first time actually that I'm giving uh, this talk uh, regarding my PhD research at McMaster. Uh, basically, I'm part of the remote science laboratory led by Professor Alemo Gonçalo, in which uh, within the lab interests uh, that drive across forestry and climate change interactions, I'm working uh, into parts that are related to earth systems models. Um, I, as you may see, I, uh, there is a structure in the top of the slides that you can follow along uh, to see what we'll be talking about. Uh, initial motivation, some tech advances that are necessary to put into in context for evaluation, uh, some discussion explainability, reproducibility, and open. Uh, open, I'll try to define that later. And uh, regarding also community responses uh, to those needs. Uh, and a small afterward uh, from the time I'm working right now. Uh, basically, this is the very preliminary research that I'm doing in terms of a review paper uh, on, uh, on the same uh, topic and probably submitting this within some six months. So I would appreciate any feedback from the audience uh, if, if people feel to. So in my view, uh, what drives science and inquiry? So uh, philosophers of science, they can split this interest uh, in two lines of thought. So one are the epistemic values that basically is uh, the values that the scientific community has in terms of the quest of science and scientists and expanding the knowledge about the unknown. So really talking about basic science, such as in math or physics, for example, or biology. And um, the, you don't need necessarily to have an application for that. It's really the inquiry that drives people on that. On the other end, there is no epistemic values. And this is majorly societal demands that drive inquiry. So this helps determine and delimiting questions that are relevant, uh, highlight ethical issues uh, that we, need, do, we may have when you are uh, establishing experiments, and also help scientists to produce models that are fit to practical societal needs. And also it's important to, to, to remember that in the non-epistemic values also, it, there is another interesting part, which is sometimes the societal need actually comes with funding. And this is also important to take in regard, like the funding, what is it used for, what are the questions that they are interested to answer. Uh, in our group, we work with climate change. And uh, this report from NOAA from last year, uh, cumulative uh, loss between 1980 and 2021, gives basically 2.1, almost $2.2 trillion uh, in disaster calculated since the 1980s. Um, initial question, and this is the question mark that I have there, is does it make sense uh, to say that $2.1 trillion were caused by climate change? And how we, we, we get uh, an estimate uh, on this fraction if it's not total? Uh, we may see that those impacts are saw in, in the warmer uh, climate in North America. So the season between July, August, September, October, November, December, they, they accumulate the events that are of higher magnitude. And more specifically, if you look on the top of, of the legend of the graphic, you may see that from 2005 on, all the major uh, events in terms of impacts, financial impacts, uh, have occurred basically from this time on. So we may see a trend that uh, things are uh, getting worse within the last decades or so. But how we can uh, attribute a uh, cause on that? Is, is, is this reasonable thought? Um, Society also brings this to us. So common questions such as, is climate change caused by humans? Yes, the last IPCC report uh, states this with like strong uh, confidence that it's caused by human factors. 
So other questions may arise when we do this first question. So uh, can we attribute who are causing this, this event in which magnitude? Uh, when finding the agents of uh, such process, do we have robust scientific evidence to characterize legal liability? How to design sound and principal adaptation plans? How to plan for remediation for loss and damages? So all those questions are really unknowns. It's really hard because you're getting into the public policy realm, but in a certain way, they really lie on assumptions that we developed uh, in, in more basic science. And we need to remember that climate change as research started uh, way back in the 70s and the 60s as a hypothesis coming from uh, scientists that were observing nature and not necessarily getting attention from the public. And now this is a really public agenda. So it shifts a little bit the, the, the character of having a non epistemic value and even funding to those lines of research have increased a lot. Uh, research motivated by uh, epistemic values and solely by it may not need to define attribution of causes because of the formalisms that you may have on experiments. So they may suffice the requirements to, to the research to be sound. However, non-epistemic research often deals with losses, and especially in this case of climate change and damages. And this may account uh, for the explainability of events. And if we are producing sound research to be able to subsidize uh, um, a, a sue by someone in court, uh, this is really complex and we need to structure this, this process well. So in the following slides, I'll try to explain that Explainability implies that I, if I want to do research on explainability, implies that I need actually to, to, implies that I need to have reproducibility and need to also have open things uh, altogether. And due to this and on current stage of research that we have all over the world, uh, this is heavily dependent on technological advances. So, Going back to the basics, uh, doing some uh, review on technology that we have on remote sensing and science as a whole. Uh, remote sensing and earth observation starting in the 70s uh, with only uh, visualization. We get processings on those huge machines that basically were fancy televisions that you have analog processors to correct those images, but not necessarily uh, you would be processing them uh, to uh, evaluate quantities of a physical way. So you'd be just looking to uh, if it was more a regular photography camera rather than an instrument that we will be trying to uh, get data from and derive and estimate probabilities of other situations or other information that you want to derive from that. Um, this up to the 80s and the 90s, uh, it became uh, uh, the, the, the rise of personal computers and coming within the remote sensing realm, the workstation era. So everyone that worked on this time uh, probably remembers the R Mapper, Envy that's up to today, uh, even our map capabilities on uh, using remote sensing. And uh, for example, Oasis Montad for geophysics. Uh, all of those who were proprietary software, uh, they came with a visualization layer, with a manipulation layer, but with a lot of abstractions that basically due to proprietary issues, uh, researchers would basically trust on the company that were building this software uh, that will be doing uh, these operations correctly. And probably they validated in the beginning, but further on, it wasn't necessarily a practice anymore of validating those software for a certain kind of algorithm application. And basically, it's, it's, it's a business uh, that lies on trust. So uh, also things that come with the workstation uh, and desktop processing is the limitations on the amount of data that can be processed and also uh, limitations on collaboration as well. So basically everything that you want to collaborate, you need to isolate that file and send to someone else via network or email or even a disk, depending uh, how difficult and large it was back in the time. So things that also happened uh, in the beginning of the 80s was Richard Stallman with the GNU project, the first Linux released. Uh, he pioneered open source software, free software, copyleft, 
and also the the personal take on work in a collaborative mode uh, sparked uh, this huge community of open source software and uh, free software that we have today and that intersects with science as well so th this was an important thing a really soft movement but uh, really important in terms of like the changes that happened up to today uh, same thing as uh, Tim Berners-Lee that created the World Wide Web, allowing people to have multimedia uh, transmitted over networks. And this created a huge change and transformed the world uh, in ways that we see today, creating collaboration, allowing us to do a presentation over Zoom, myself from Canada and you in Colombia. So this also was fundamental to the development of e-science as well because it helps to structure uh, applications that has better uh, human computer interactions and therefore uh, scientists that are not CS people uh, they can basically get into research on a more effective way on a more accessible way uh, back in the late 80s beginning of the 90s the open source spatial analysis that was developed uh, it had several forms, several people remember from GRASS, uh, Quantum Gs that actually became QGIS, and then uh, the, the last version of it was basically uh, done by Boundless View up to 2019 before being bought by Planet Division on Public Affairs. Uh, but basically consisted on QGIS, which is basically an open version that's compatible, let's say, to, as a GIS system, desktop one. Uh, open layers that allow visualization over a web service. Uh, GeoServer that actually acts on several protocols and APIs to process and visualize data majorly uh, on, uh, on vector format, but with some support of rasters and PostGIS uh, as a database and with some uh, structure to support raster processing as well. But really limited um, for, for a long time in terms of scalability uh, because of indexing and complexities of, of the, the PostGIS structure. Uh, this, all the software was based on a foundation of work done by the community that developed Godal and OGR. That was uh, a very smart move that they actually use MIT license for it. And therefore any company, even private companies that want to make profit could use that, that toolkit to be the base of their software. So Esri, uh, Oasis, Oasis Montage from now Sequent uh, and other companies that you do GIS, basically they use the same toolkit and therefore this allows uh, interoperability and compatibilization across uh, different implementations. Uh, another contribution of the open source spatial stack comes more recently with the contributions from group of Professor Luke Anseling from the Spatial Data Science Group at the University of Chicago, basically on geostatistics and spatial data science by the release of Geoda and as well as PySol together with Surge Ray. Uh, computational science over the years also gave a lot of progress uh, in terms of like bringing uh, HPC uh, capabilities in a more popularized way with lots of investments for several areas of research. Advances on parallel and distributed computing now allow very heavy workflows uh, reaching exascale. Uh, functional programming uh, within Python language, uh, for example, NumPy and SciPy uh, allows researchers that can, let's say from uh, MATLAB and Octave to do this kind of development within Python, but with more efficiency because they're using now libraries that are really optimizing without needing to pay a license. So it really democratized the way that we do science. On the other uh, way, the, the rise of cloud computing and cloud providers uh, allowed users to use infrastructure as a software and platform as a, as a software on demand, which allowed the large research groups to scale out research on unprecedented levels but also small groups allowed, uh, were allowed actually to test research that was even feasible before using cloud grants, such as the ones from Amazon AWS, from Google Cloud, or for, from Azure. So this, this thing doesn't need you to establish an entire data center. And you can basically pay as you go and 
it, it, it really works for people that do different lines of research and wants to, to test or even try to validate any kind of, of procedure done in the cloud. Uh, also, uh, the cloud allowed large storage with simultaneous collaborations. Everyone knows GitHub, Google, G Suite, uh, Office 365, but also a scientific storage was developed on that. Um, and massive uh, data now can be also transferred with the usage of the Globus toolkit that becomes Globus Online and now the Globus platform for data publication. Um, this basically paved the, the, the beginning of the e-science move uh, with the establishment of uh, grid computing uh, that basically allowed uh, research labs that has large machines to collaborate within uh, very separated networks. Uh, fields that were impacted on this are many, uh, such as computational biology, genomic, astrophysics, uh, for example, cosmology, everyone perhaps remembers Setia at home uh, that was really popular back in the 90s, uh, which everyone used the screen server and would help people from uh, the Setia Institute to locate life uh, on, on other planets, uh, but also on high energy physics and more recently material science and medicine. Um, the efforts on e-science are paving something new that's called Science 2.0, which is actually a different model of science, difficult to know if it will be realized, but uh, it would involve shared and open data, software, computational resources, ideally for free or with very low cost across the world of science. Uh, so this is really important, but it has several issues on policy that needs to be crossed before that. Um, the Python community organized uh, to create an ecosystem of libraries and works pretty well. Everyone that works on Python now um, sees this, this, this strength, especially when compared to other communities, for example, the R community that has some variance between packages, but now uh, in recent years, they got better on unifying structures or unifying standards across packages. Uh, also the emergence of frameworks uh, for parallel distributed computing, so such as Hadoop, Spark, Dask, Kafka, Flink, Parsu, et cetera. So this also helped on bringing a very robust scalable computing to people that actually were used it to do OpenMP and MPI. Uh, so this was actually really interesting that in recent years, there was a strong focus and adherence on that. Uh, also, it's really important to highlight the emergence of Docker and Singularity containers that basically together with uh, Python repositories that are created such as Anaconda and ConduForge and Git-based solutions basically helps projects to keep consistent, atomic and enforcing interoperability across uh, platforms, but also across projects. So this, this helps on reproducibility and provenance as well. Um, in terms of like the major contributions of machine learning, we can forget the GPU emergence on the mid 2000s and basically uh, all the linear algebra uh, research that came together with that. Uh, and the like two or even three uh, orders of magnitude of acceleration that happened within this time and uh, the, the easiness that became to use those GPUs, especially in recent years with the rapid suit that uh, NVIDIA released, but also with the, the deep learning frameworks that became uh, uh, more often used, uh, started with TensorFlow Keras and uh, Torch, uh, but we have other ones that disappeared over time. Basically, if you look on publications, we see a predominance between uh, PyTorch and uh, Keras nowadays with TensorFlow sometimes, uh, and a rise of Julia language on recent years. Uh, this is happening a lot of interoperability between model and platforms with the Open Neural Network Exchange, especially I think on industry that you need actually to port and do maintain and uh, do uh, governance, especially IT governance of those models for machine learning. 
uh, this is really important to basically even to do auditing of companies that are based on, on this line of work. Uh, more recently also, uh, it started to show up scientific model hubs such as uh, Radiant Foundation uh, model hub on uh, machine learning, especially the deep learning models for remote sensing and also material science such as DL Hub. Uh, that's how that you, at U Chicago with Argon. Um, another free thing that was really important was the, the, the beginning of the free satellite data. This cannot be uh, uh, looked as a minor thing because before 2008, you would pay uh, $4,000 for a Landsat scene that just covered 185 by 175 kilometers. So to do global scale studies such as Map Biomas does in Brazil to cover deforestation, this is really hard and it will be totally unfeasible to do that line of research without having free data. Um, from that period on, ESA also partnered on this and the major uh, uh, public agencies are sharing data for free and on more, um, how can I say, standardized formats, which help to interoperate the, this kind of work. Uh, cross calibration, harmonization of data also helped on basically uh, ramp up models across different kinds of data that you're using. So you can train a model on Copernicus Sentinel data and then try to do inference on Landsat and ideally should work. But more, more research needs to be done, especially when you are shifting from multispectral to hyperspectral, for example. Um, these initiatives, all, all the packages are enabling important platforms as a service. Uh, for example, Google Earth Engine was totally uh, done uh, with that. Noel Gorlick said this several times uh, on different talks. And IBM Paris also, uh, they took advantage of this free data. Um, the Landsat impact also can be seen here, like the difference on the amount of publications and downloads of images. It's astonishing after 2008 and growing exponentially. Uh, also, the massive profusion of papers in AI for observation. So looking on random forest or support vector machine uh, based uh, papers is growing steadily and also on, on a very steady pace non-linear in a certain way uh, from let's say 2013, 2014 on, and also with deep learning on remote sensing, but more recently, because the community is based on, on domain scientists that actually need to get used and do partnerships to use those technologies, especially the most recent ones, for example, as transformer networks. So now we can talk about a little bit of explainability. Um, shifting gears a little bit. So having in mind this, this thoughts, we're getting some, some pillars here. So the explainability first origins was on porphyry tree, uh, the porphyry of Tyre back in the beginnings uh, of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the science period. Basically he founded category theory uh, by incorporating Aristotle's logic into Neoplatonism. Uh, the advantage, if you can see here in the picture, you can see certain kinds of names here, basically in this uh, parts of leaves. And then when you see the, the branches joining, you can infer that they are similar than, for example, than the others that are on the other side or here, for example. And therefore you have this notion of hierarchy and similarity. With this notion over time, scientists develop several uh, structures to, to work with uh, explainability. In XAI, uh, we can basically split, and this is a definition by Kamath and Liu last year, very seminal book published and getting somehow a notice, but consolidated a lot of work that spread across the community. I really recommend uh, people to look on this book. Um, basically, they, they separate this on scope, on stage and model. So, um, the, the scope can be split on global methods, uh, which they seem to explain the predictions overall model from comprehensive top-down approach. You want to see the general structure, the general outline, and how this does predictions. 
the local methods and on the other end uh, tries to see how part of the sample affects into the output so you basically isolate it and do the analysis um, the idea is trying to understand specific contributions so you freeze for example a uh, part of a neural network and trying to do a uh, variance and on, on the free uh, portion and see how the output behaves, for example, could be part of a simulation run, for example. Uh, on, in terms of stage, you can apply these techniques on the pre-model phase is really traditional that. So data visualization, exploratory data analysis can be done on this part. Um, it happens even uh, before you select a model for a model. So um, it's, it's really traditional, but it's important to highlight that you have several methods that works on explaining a behavior on this and really based on traditional statistical methods. Intrinsic methods are uh, more related to some lines of modeling uh, that actually have self-explanatory behaviors such as decision trees and random forests, for example. Uh, generalized linear logistic and clustering, especially the hierarchical uh, clustering. So, but you have costs. You 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 lose this this kind of 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 generalization uh, better performance in terms of generalization, and uh, but you gain in terms of like explainability. explainability. And the post hoc, uh, you can actually do the model and try to basically do an inverse analysis of all your process. And then you don't have necessarily guarantees that you'll be understanding what's going on within the network. So it's, it's complicated, but you can somehow uh, try to invert those networks and, and see the relationships between samples and predictions. In terms of the model, models uh, can uh, the disinterpretability could be uh, agnostic across models, and uh, you want to apply, for example, in terms of like uh, neural networks, but also for decision trees, it would suffice. But for example, there are some methods that are more specific, and then you want actually to under get those model characteristics to highlight a certain point that helps. For example, decision trees. Here, there's a summary that they do also in the book that they categorize here. So really like the traditional methods on exploratory uh, data analysis, you may have graphical methods, but also non-graphical stat analysis, which basically could be even from traditional for some number, uh, for a number summary, but up to uh, more sophisticated, uh, for example, um, uh, how can I say, um, the, the relationship across variables, variance, covariance, this kind of stuff. Um, in terms of like the interpretation methods that are intrinsic, you can uh, split them on linear regression, more traditional with Bayesian, uh, naive Bayes, Bayesian networks, attention networks, for example, but also the model agnostics. And then comes the, the, the ones that are getting uh, very a uh, lot of attention, such as silency maps or chat. So I would recommend everyone to look this. Um, it's part of also my own PhD research to, to learn better about these families, especially the ones that are applied to neural networks. In terms of like reproducibility, uh, we can uh, re uh, remember Francis Bacon as the founder of Royal Society and one of the, uh, the pioneers on scientific method. He defined uh, as the father of empiricism and using uh, inductive reasoning. And always important to remind that models are models and we don't need necessarily to trust from them from the beginning. And actually we need to do uh, a criteria evaluation on every model. So the citation like, if a man will begin with certainties, he shall end in doubts. But if we will be, uh, content to begin with doubts, it shall end in certainty. Uh, scientific method evolved a lot uh, during the years. Uh, the one point I want to highlight is that always at the end, you get results that you need to publish and it needs to be peer reviewed. So due to this, you may have a situation that 
uh, people want to reproduce your experiment and therefore reproducibility pains arise on that part, either from the reviewers, either from people that read your paper. Um, there is a difference between reproducibility versus replication. Replication is really obtaining the same results. So I want to get fixed values, understand the experiment and get the exact same result you got on your experiment. Uh, in terms of reproducibility, actually you want to get the same technique, perhaps using different data or different, slightly different situation, but obtain the same outcomes. It really depends on the publication that you have. But it's really important to remember that when you're doing reproducibility, you don't need to get strict the same results. So, but you need to have boundaries and need to have certain levels of formalisms that you are able to guarantee that you reproduce an experiment. In terms of like recent computational reproducibility, it's important to highlight these things in terms of automation and provenance tracking. And we were talking about automation even from the source of data coming to your Jupyter notebook using APIs and using endpoints that are created and they will be actually on for years and years to come. Um, this relates actually to availability of data and software related to the FAIR data principles as well, but you can think on fairness in terms of, of, of software. You can talk about uh, software documentation. So people need to know how to basically install your experiment. Imagine that, for example, if you're sharing a Docker container, how do I, I, I launch this container? Uh, if I'm basically passing a, a code base and, and, and uh, some data, how can I get uh, this, infra, this data to work with that code base? Do I need to install libraries? Um, there are several discussions on this. Uh, in terms of also software engineering, all your code before release should be code tested you should have continuous integration, continuous deployment in a certain level of complexity of your experiment. Uh, you should have proper release, version control, bug tracking, community channels to chat with the developers or the scientists or both. Um, also needs to be assessed copyright issues on data, software and methods as well. Nowadays, even methods and even experiments are subject to patents. So it's really important to assess all this dimensionality when you're structuring your projects, because you want to, to be shareable, you want to be reusable. And, and later on, you, you struggle on this if you have issues on, on licensing. And also the open reporting of results. So ideally, uh, your report should be accessible to anyone. And if there are barriers, there, there should be ways for people to minimize those barriers, even for people that, for example, want to do research on very expensive computational hardware, for example, or very specific hardware that is not accessible to anywhere, people should have access on means to reproduce that experiment on that ex uh, expensive hardware, for example. Uh, there are several literature on this. I recommend things that are done uh, by the Alan Turing Institute in, in, in the UK, such as the Turing Way, there is this new work uh, by my colleague Alejandro Poca Castro, also Colombian as well, the Environmental Data Science book. Also, uh, he's looking for collaborators for this, this book. Uh, Professor Antonio Pais here at McMaster has an interesting course on reproducible research workflow in R that basically use R Markdown and R notebooks. And it's a completely different thing when compared to use uh, the Python community because several times the data is small and then you can include it as a, as a R package. So it helps really in terms of like installing and, and uh, making reproducible. And also the very recent NASA Transform to Open Science initiative that will be covering uh, for the next five years, this kind of, 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 of techniques and discussions and approach. Um, data, open data. So open data needs to be fair. So findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We have been talking this for some time, but uh, we cannot exhaust that uh, data should have data and metadata related to experiments. They need to be findable by both humans and computers. Nowadays, it's really common to use, for example, APIs that search for your data, for example, for the stack uh, protocol for spatial data. So if you don't have proper metadata, your data won't be indexed. Uh, in terms of accessibility, data should contain instructions on how it can be loaded 
and open free protocol. So should have difficulties on assessing that protocol, shouldn't be proprietary, for example. Uh, needs to be interoperable, and this is really wide, but you should have vocabularies in terms of indexation and linkage to other research efforts, for example, to, to be able to, to, to link the research, but also to be ingested and processed in various workflows and systems and somehow relates to definable uh, criteria as well and accessible as well. And reusable, you, you need to optimize data reuse by enforcing proper metadata, including description, lic licensing, and publication in platform, ideally open platforms that everyone can register for scientific purposes, at least. Software can be fair too. There is a very interesting workshop that was done by uh, Dr. Ogali this year. I would recommend this is on the reference section. You can look this later. Uh, but basically you can make software uh, findable by assigning DOI, for example, using Zenodo tied to GitHub, uh, using domain vocabularies from a curated list, depending on the domain science that you do. Uh, including software and citation with metadata. You need to use Zenodo really and uh, taking snapshots of GitHub and versioning capabilities of both GitHub linked to Zenodo as well for each versioning. Uh, you can also use the, the common workflow language and workflow description language actually to make your process of deployment more interoperable. Um, reuse, you can license on an open term including a machine readable version, provenance should be addressed. And remembering the Godal contribution, if you do this on MIT license, even private company can use. And then there's a balance between, do you want to file a patent and perhaps earn money, or you want to actually to transform the field that you are into. So questions to be asked and, and even the funding that you use for your research. Depending on situations, you can have issues of needing open hardware as well, because nowadays are surging several companies such as Samba Nova and Cerebras, for example, that are pushing uh, very strong players such as NVIDIA, Intel, and AMD with these new chips for machine learning, but they are really niche uh, hardware and it's really hard to find uh, uh, a good amount of available uh, institutes that have this kind of hardware. So if you do research on that and it's conditioned to a certain aspect of that hardware, how do you enforce that uh, your experiment is reproducible? So you need to think on ways for people to check your data, even from the peer review process, but also later on. Um, this is not limited to uh, things on chips and machine learning and deep learning, but also to any kind of expensive hardware that anyone uses on science. So let's talk about uh, of some responses that we had and closing to the, my threshold of 40 minutes, I'll try to complete fast. But um, the majority of the public here, I think they use the Google Earth Engine. Google Earth Engine provide a platform as a service uh, basically, this is the JavaScript visualization. You have the code, you have the plot on the console inspector. You can see uh, pointers for debugging your code uh, after running or even during runtime. And the task uh, tab, you can uh, follow up with larger tasks, especially for the export ones. Uh, all on, on the left panel, you, you have all your code. And actually, this is synced to a Git repository that actually can link to a GitHub repository or to a private Git that you may have. It has also access to documentation and the assets, which is basically uh, proprietary images that you may have or any kind of assets that you develop by yourself, but that are not part of the Earth Engine massive catalog of remote sensing images. Uh, the architecture is quite uh, unknown because they use a bunch of infrastructure as a software, such as Borg, Spanner, Colossus, uh, Google Fusion Tables was deprecated recently and replaced by BigQuery, but they, they don't use, uh, let's say, a system and they manage all solely for Google Earth Engine. They actually use a production level system that uh, is used across the entire uh, organization. I think that's pretty smart to think. Um, in terms of, of the advantages, I think, of Google Earth Engine, it stores all data with its original properties. So uh, despite rechunking uh, all the scenes that comes from the agencies, for example, for storage optimization, 
uh, they keep uh, the original projection, original resolution, and original bit depth. This is really interesting because it does introduce biases on your data, and uh, this is a major issue if you're especially using deep learning algorithms. GE uh, done a huge impact on science. This is uh, a recent paper on the track of publications that use Google Earth Engine. And basically, uh, optic data, and we can tell about, again, the contribution of open free Landsat data and uh, as a sentinels to that is basically driving this kind of transformation. And also not the massive catalog, but the ability to calculate it. So it wasn't feasible, uh, it wasn't enough if uh, those agencies published this data only. Need to have means that researchers from domain science can uh, calculate and, and, and use this kind of software. IBM, some years ago, I've, 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 I'm proud to say that uh, I've been on IBM Research in 2017, uh, interning uh, with C1 Lu and Hendrik Hammond uh, on the project that was called IBM Paris back in the time, and now it's called IBM Environmental Intelligence Suite. Uh, it's a different platform. It's free also for scientists, as far as I know nowadays still. Uh, but their goal actually is trying to produce, since the beginning, production software for enterprise. So they try to consolidate a lot of databases. They even bought an entire company, which was the Weather Corporation that gave them the largest uh, database in terms of like weather and climate records globally. Uh, so they basically integrated this all together now with the Watson suit. And uh, you may basically uh, mix this data and do spatial temporal queries uh, very fast more specifically because of the structure of the HBase that they use, the way that the key value store that uh, they develop there, the way that they're structured, the indexes, it helps a lot to be efficient on spatial temporal queries. It's not efficient on other kinds of applications. So for example, in terms of machine learning runs, it could be complicated. Sometimes it's even, uh, easier to move data out to a different silo, process it outside and re-ingest. But it's a different line of workflow. It's 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 more for uh, big data analytics in a certain way. They also did a nice job to exposing uh, all the, the the infrastructure to OGC standards. So basically, you can plug ArcGIS, you can plug uh, QGIS, any kind of WMS, WPS endpoint uh, consuming uh, client could be working on that. The only thing that they do is that on ingestion, they resample and reproject all data sets to WGS84 to conform. And this helps actually to keep queries uniform and gives a, a faster processing. But this may introduce biases. So it depends on your application, it could be an issue. Uh, also what happened in recent years, uh, more like from 2000s on, uh, is the surge of array databases, and we cannot highlight enough the, the incredible work done by Peter Baumann uh, in Germany uh, with Erasdemann, but also by Teralib done by INPE in Brazil, uh, post-GIS raster module that was basically um, making accessible for people that were doing GIS to integrate with uh, with remote sensing and other libraries that appeared, especially Site B, that got a lot of popularity recently. Uh, the Pangeo stack, which has become more and more popular, perhaps uh, on, the, on the group community means things that we have. Sometimes we hear often that what will happen when Google shuts down and charges everyone fees for using Google Earth Engine probably everyone should move to Pangeo because Pangeo, you basically have open source software and you can deploy either on the cloud, on HPC machines, or even on your own laptop. And basically your code base doesn't change much because of the magic of using Dask and NumPy and other uh, Python libraries that basically uh, transposing these barriers across platforms become really, really small. Optimization wise, it's not the best, I would say. Uh, we could have a better HPC done, but still could be an issue that can be improved. Uh, and I think they are working really hard to get on that. Um, 
things that we may discuss this on during the discussion time, but uh, it's really getting traction. The community is large, has more, more, more than 5,000 people on their uh, discourse channel right now. I think that open challenges that we have is that we have lots of infrastructure and methodology already developed. Uh, however, training the scientists, the domain scientists that actually consumes this on this new paradigm of the science 2.0 or the e-science or the fourth paradigm science, as one may say, is really, really hard. We don't see a shift on curriculum on, on the universities, especially on the earth sciences departments. And uh, we need to, to, to think more about this. Uh, hackathons and workshops won't suffice this change, in my opinion. We need actually to rethink curriculum. Um, developing end-to-end uh, -end open reproducible XAI for AO, it's really difficult, uh, even from a financial standpoint, because you often need engineering and uh, just large groups can afford such kind of work. So we see groups, for example, Columbia Group from Raya Bernafe, uh, they have support from uh, Toiled, but it's part of a massive grant that they have, and this is the United States. But when we think, for example, South America, Africa, or Asia, certain regions, it could be difficult. So this is another thing to think, like ways of structure agencies to have common, harder, common infrastructures that you can set up that kind of environment and therefore provides this kind of services for our users, getting more and more importance. Um, also, there is a huge gap between that first part of the talk uh, between policymakers and domain scientists. So they're keeping doing questions and we're still uh, building a lot of interesting software, but how much we are actually answering their, their questions and later on actually how we are subsidizing them to do the changes that, for example, in climate change are needed right now. So if we want to do change, to do proper uh, adaptation policies, and do we have the infrastructure? Do we have the proper analytics with full science and full support to, to, to that? It's, it's really difficult to assess. Um, for scientists, it can be quite difficult actually to, and this is a, a minor point between people that run labs, but I'm also interested on that, um, that choosing between platforms as a service, such as Google Earth Engine or Pairs, they are more convenient to use, low barrier to train the users, but they are more expensive and you can get jailed in a platform and then uh, due to uh, contract or uh, circumstances change, you may get some issues on your research, reproducibility in future, or even explainability. Uh, and infrastructure as a service, you always need backup. So backup of people and backup of infrastructure. So balancing that, it's, it's kind of a discussion, but I think every kind of domain science lab is doing and hitting their head on the wall to solve those issues right now. I would like to thank you a lot for the University of Chicago Center for Spatial Data Science that actually uh, invited me to give uh, this talk on their behalf, uh, especially Julia Koshinsky, the lab director and Blue Kensley. Uh, also, I would like to thank my advisor, Professor Lemo Gonsamo from, and, and the entire McMaster University Remote Science Laboratory. Uh, for the support of my research and, and, and inquiry uh, for, for, uh, that I have on this line of work. Professor Antonio Pais, that I took uh, the reproducible research class with him uh, last year, was really good. And then CERC and WWF uh, Canada that support us in our lab. Uh, thank you, and I'm open to questions. <laughs>